it's um, of course it's a grim anniversary of uh, of an important day uh, about a year ago on the seventh of October. But uh, we'll we'll be talking certainly about that during this event, uh, but also other things as well. So uh, we look forward to you being an active part of this discussion today. But but thank you all for being here. It's really a pleasure to, to see you. While I got you here and, and while I'm speaking, let me also let you know, I, I think you have your, uh, your, your programs there. I may <clears throat> let you know about a couple of uh, upcoming programs that we have. We have uh, on, the, on the 16th of this month, we have Rick Caruso, former mayor candidate. And uh, as, I, as I hear possible governor uh, candidate for governor uh, uh, coming in. That'll be at Loyola High School uh, on the 16th of uh, October. We also have on the 29th, uh, you know, there's a new president in Mexico, Claudia Scheinbaum, and uh, that, that could mark a very big change in U.S.-Mexican relations. We have the Consul General of Mexico, uh, Ambassador Carlos Gonzalez Gutierrez, who will be uh, talking about that along with a, a professor, uh, Robert Soro, from, from USC. Uh, on uh, at, at that'll be in Hancock Park at the official residence of the of the uh, Consul General, and that's the 29th of October. On the on the first of November, by the way, we have also uh, it'll be right here in this room. Will be Stephen Cook, who is a CFR Council on Re Foreign Relations fellow, and he'll be talking about uh, the Middle East. And so uh, lots there, there's lots to talk about there. We also have I noticed there's lots of students in the room. Uh, we have and thank you all for being here. We have on the 15th a, a, our, of November, and that'll be at Marlboro School, we have uh, a, a program on elections. And it'll be right after the election, so it'll be a little bit of follow-up and how those work and, and all about that. So if, if any of you are, are not aware of that event, please let us know, and we'll make sure that your school gets invited. But we're glad to have you all here. Uh, but let me introduce Terry McCarthy, who will be our moderator for today. And many of you I know know Terry from, uh, from years past. Uh, he is currently the CEO of the American Society of Cinematographers. But uh, he had, before that, uh, he, he was 27 years as a journalist, uh, a very, uh, an amazing career as, as a journalist. He was, uh, he had, during that time, he was in print media as well as television. He has four Emmys. He was uh, with CBS in Afghanistan. He was in Iraq with ABC News. He was with Time Magazine in Shanghai and in Japan and Indonesia and Cambodia and Burma and many other places. But uh, he, the other thing he was was the president of and CEO of the World Affairs Council here in Los Angeles from 2012 to 2018. Uh, and so um, what we tried to do was lure him back into the world of international relations from cinematography. So will you please uh, join me in, in welcoming uh, our, our moderator, who will introduce our speaker, Yaroslav Trofimov. Oh, we can do better than that, can't we please? Yes, yes. We just have one mic. Please, thank you, Richard. Thank you for that very generous introduction. So nice to see so many familiar faces from the World Affairs Council. I'm delighted to be here. Let me first just pay tribute to Richard to how you've brought new energy to the Council and your staff doing a great job, a nice lineup of events coming up. I know it was a big challenge during COVID, but nice to see the World Affairs Council um, getting some extra energy. That's great. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, we have got a lot of interesting things to discuss with our Speaker Yaroslav Trofimov. Yaroslav and I met in Baghdad um, quite some years ago, <laughs> um, and I've been reading him for a long time. Yaroslav has been a correspondent for the Wall Street Journal since 1999, so from the past century, as he, uh, <laughs> as he, <laughs> as he pointed out. Um, but one of the great things about Yaroslav, he's, he's probably one of our leading foreign correspondents in the United States at the moment, and one of the great things about Yaroslav is He's not only a very good uh, on-the-ground reporter, as you will see when you read his book about Ukraine, but he has this ability to see the bigger picture as well. And that comes partly from just being in the field for so long and, and seeing how these things play out. And that's, I think, very important, um, not only for the Middle East, which is going through an extraordinary, uh, I don't know even what to call it, uh, a realignment of, of power structures, which we have no idea where that's going to end up, but also in you know uh, his his home country of Ukraine, um, 
where we have, I would say, an existential conflict going on. And, and there will be some ramifications of, from our side, because the United States has a big role to play in Ukraine as well as in the Middle East. And we're going to talk all about that today. Um, but let's start, Yaroslav, if we may, with the year, one year on. We're one year and, what is it, two days uh, since Hamas crossed the border from Gaza into Israel and very bad things happened. Uh, it's been horrendous to see the uh, pain that both sides have endured um, in this past year. Um, and it's also been interesting to see how it has changed the picture of the Middle East. I'm wondering what your headline takeaway would be from a year after Gaza. Yeah, thank you so much, Sherry. Uh, and indeed, it was a long time ago in Baghdad. Um, so yeah, a year on. Obviously, it's still war in progress. Uh, uh, things can still change. Uh, it's very hard to predict anything in the Middle East ever. And I think uh, the one lesson I've learned from covering the Middle East for all this time is that it never pays off to be an optimist. <laughs> because things can always be worse uh, than you imagine, which is exactly the lesson of October, October 7th last year. Uh, it was, first of all, a failure of imagination uh, by the Israeli security establishment, its intelligence services, uh, you know, and uh, the U.S. government, frankly, because uh, you know, if you all remember, Jake Sullivan had authored a piece on foreign affairs saying that you know we have the Middle East under control. <coughs> uh, good times ahead, and so um, that failure obviously led to tragic events in southern Israel, you know, 1,200 people killed, hundreds uh, taken hostage and uh, brought to Gaza. Um, but also it highlighted the uh, weaknesses of, of the institutions that Israel had been, had been building up for such a long time, and the legend of which was, in a way, one of Israel's strongest deterrents. The, so the, so the legend of Mossad, the all-seeing Mossad, the legend of Israeli technology that was supposedly deployed along the separation uh, fence and was going to thwart any infiltration. All that didn't work. And so uh, if we look at what was happening a year ago, there was a perception in the region and in the world that you know, the king is, the emperor is naked, that Israel is not near as strong as people think. And I think the mistake that was made uh, by Israel's enemies uh, not just Hamas, but by Hezbollah and Iran, was to overestimate that weakness. And Israel was not as weak as its enemies imagined. And also, uh, it was much more determined because uh, the conflict in Israel was obviously seen as existential. Uh, and all the previous red lines just no longer existed. So what do we have now, a year on? We have... Uh, Israel uh, restoring its ability uh, to deter. You know, we have seen uh, the assassinations in uh, Lebanon of first the pager attacks, then you know the day later the walkie-talkies, then a few days later, you know, the, the head of Hezbollah, who's been, you know, uh, Hassan Nasrallah, who's been running the organization for more than 30 years and really built it up into the most formidable non-state actor, or in probably one of the most probable armies in the Middle East, assassinated uh, uh, in, the, in the bombing of his headquarters uh, together with the deputy head of the Iranian uh, Revolutionary Guard Corps. And then we had more and more strikes that basically you know, not just decapitated Hezbollah, but also uh, showed that its ability uh, to fire uh, missiles and rockets into Israel is nowhere near what was feared. Because if you remember, Hezbollah was built with its tens of thousands of missiles and rockets as a, an insurance policy for Iran, a, uh, an arm that would allow Iran to protect itself against an Israeli direct attack, because the idea was, like, if you touch Iran, Hezbollah would have the ability to spread fire all over Israel, destroy its vital infrastructure, and, uh, and therefore it's a price that no Israeli government would be willing to pay. Well, guess what? It's not happening. Uh, so, and uh, we are now on the verge of another much more serious round in the direct confrontation between Iran and Israel, which by itself signifies uh, the failure of 
Iran's overall Middle East strategy for the last 30 years. The strategy was you build up a network of proxies that are deniable, and so they will absorb all the pain, they will pay all the sacrifices and blood, but Iranian homeland is immune. Well, and now instead of these proxies defending Iran, it's Iran that has to defend the proxies and is now you know, facing a, uh, a very significant Israeli uh, strike on its own homeland. So uh, the other side of this balance sheet, obviously, is that while Israel has restored its, the fear of its uh, intelligence and military services, it's come at a huge price uh, to civilians uh, in the Gaza Strip. You know, tens of thousands of people were killed there, uh, increasingly civilians in Lebanon, and uh, uh, more importantly for Israel's long-time security, uh, its just global standing in the world, in the West, uh, where uh, support uh, uh, for it is uh, eroding. And I think the other uh, consequence that we are seeing uh, from the attack on the global, on the global stage is that uh, the conflict in the Middle East, the conflict uh, in Ukraine, and pretty much all the major conflicts in the world are increasingly overlapping and bleeding into each other. Uh, we are uh, seeing the direct military cooperation between Iran and Russia uh, that started off with the supplies of Iranian um, drone, uh, strike drones um, uh, to strike Ukrainian cities. You know, thousands have been uh, fired by Russia. Uh, there's now been an agreement on you know, supplying Iranian uh, ballistic missiles to Russia. And more importantly, if you look at uh, the latest uh, article by Tony Blinken, uh, Secretary of State in Foreign Affairs, he said that uh, Russia went from uh, trying to stop the Iranian nuclear program to actually helping it. And so uh, that is a potentially you know, very, very important development where Russia becomes a proliferation actor. And that all fits into this overall strategy of this rising axis of, you know, autocracies, of rogue states, you know, Russia, Iran, North Korea, and that already have a direct military alliance among them, especially in, you know, I mean, military cooperation between Russia and Iran, and a formal alliance now between Russia and North Korea, and China that is well not involved directly militarily with any of them is increasingly uh, enabling that uh, alliance with technology, with financial support, diplomatic cover, etc. Uh, and increasingly using uh, the war in Gaza, you know, the war in Lebanon now, uh, to claim the moral high ground and to push against you know, the moral arguments that the U.S. and allies were making against Russia and the other autocratic regimes, uh, you know, when the war in Ukraine began. So that's, I think, where we stand. So I'm curious, as you rightly say, Israel's intelligence services and the IDF were completely caught by surprise um, when Hamas came across the, the border. And yet, all these stunning intelligence coups that we've seen in the last, pretty much in the last month, these were all in place before that kicked off. So the bomb that they, they pre-positioned in the guest house in Tehran, which killed Ismail Haniyeh, the uh, political head of, of Hamas, that wasn't put in the last few months. That has probably been there for, for quite some time. The a fake company they set up in Hungary to manufacture the pagers which took out so many Hezbollah operatives in, in Lebanon. They didn't do that in the last few months either. So it seems to me like the Israeli security services and the intelligence services, they had refocused a lot of their energies away from Gaza. And that to me is a political problem and goes right up to the top, I would think. I think it's both a political problem and, uh, but also, you know, despite the political guidance, you know, the military had its own duties and they failed, uh, and the intelligence service, they failed, they failed to uh, keep their eye on the ball. I mean, I think the precise reason why uh, October 7 happened uh, was because Israel, since the war in 2006, did focus its intelligence assets on Lebanon, on Hezbollah, and increasingly on Iran. You know, we have all this, you know, infiltrations in Iran over the years, you know, the assassinations of sci nuclear scientists, uh, you know, et cetera. So uh, they were building up their networks in the north because that is obviously a more existential threat. You know, Hamas, uh, for all its capabilities, uh, you know, is not able to wipe out Israel, <laughs> uh, at least at this stage. Uh, 
and uh, but there was also, as you rightly say, the assumption in Washington and in uh, in the Israeli government that you know we could, the Qataris are funding uh, the operations of the Hamas government in Gaza. Uh, Hamas is tamed; it's it's not interested in escalating further. It's you know it has its own little fiefdom, and everybody is happy. Uh, that was a mistake, obviously. That was a mistake, uh, uh, and in a way, uh, there was this symbiotic relationship between uh, Hamas and uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and many of his allies, because neither of them is interested in two-state solution or advancing anywhere near towards the state solution. And so uh, Netanyahu could always say, well, you know, look at this, you know, this Hamas, how can we talk to them? Because they want to wipe us out. And Hamas could gain the support of many Palestinians in Gaza because they could rightly say, well, you know, there's no prospects for any Palestinian state any time forward. Uh, in the future, there is no prospect for us to live in dignity. So, uh, you know, our only option is the armed struggle. So let me bring up that very controversial uh, topic of the two-state solution. Yeah. It is both the only way that peace will come and it is the only thing that nobody wants, um, pretty much in terms of the ma major players, right? You've got a clear um, requirement from the Saudis. We need some settlement with the Palestinians before we continue with the Abram Accords and, and make peace with Israel, which everyone wants. Um, but you've got a prime minister in Israel who clearly doesn't want it with his right-wing backers. And Yahya Shinwar, in, in, in whatever tunnel he's in, he doesn't want it either. Um, what's the future there? Are we going to move towards that in some crab-like way where we go around backwards and end up there? or? Is it over? I mean, as you know, the support in Israel has, has plummeted. There's, there's, uh, I think 70% will be against the two-state solution. Now. Will that recover? What's, what's your feeling in the sort of medium to long term there? Yes, yeah, I spent quite a bit of time in Israel this past year, and uh, it's very hard to speak about the two-state solution uh, when the, you know, the leading political movement in, uh, in the Palestinian territories in Gaza, and, and probably if you were to ask people in the West Bank, advocates you know, in its charter and its program, you know, the killing or expulsion pretty much all the five or six million Jews living between the river and the sea. Uh, you know, and uh, at the same time, uh, the realities that we see in the West Bank make, you know, with the settlements expanding, uh, making, make, make uh, any two-state solution more and more difficult with every year. But if you look at it sort of removed from today, the events of today, there is one basic fact, right? There is the Palestinians and there are Israelis living between the river and the sea. Uh, you know, roughly equal numbers. And there are only two ways forward. Either there is going to be mutual extermination, you know, and, and you know, millions will be driven away or killed, which nobody wants, except maybe Yahya Shimar and some, and maybe it's, you know, some people on the, on the fringe of the Israeli establishment, not establishment, Israeli politics. Uh, or they will find a way to get along somehow over time and find solutions. That has been elusive over the past many decades, uh, but it doesn't mean that it will never happen. How, mm. it's very hard to imagine now, and also it all depends on how the, uh, the global balance of power will develop, and in the region. And it's also the case that the, the main troublemaker there, Iran, who was behind Hamas, behind Hezbollah, has been um, severely punished, and, and not just punished, but, but sort of embarrassed in its inability to, to react. So whether that, in the longer term, changes the dial a bit, I wonder. Well, so, uh, I mean, Iran is somewhat weakened now, and did lose a great deal of its power uh, that it was projecting through Hezbollah, but don't count it out. You know, it's still a huge country. Remember in 2003, in 2003, you know, when the U.S. was in Afghanistan, the U.S. was in Iraq, Iran was surrounded by American bases and, and feeling very weak. It's managed to bounce back with this network of proxies they built up, and you know, and kind of help drive the U.S. out of Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, so, um, though, you know, very momentous things have happened in the past several weeks, you know, this is not yet a tectonic shift in the balance of power in the region. So, 
we wait to see what Israel, how it will respond um, to, the, to the missiles that it, it had from Iran um, just recently. But I'm wondering what you see of the US policy now going forward. Blinken has invested countless hours in trying to force an agreement, hasn't worked. Um, we're about to see a change in administration uh, in the United States. It's, it's been pretty common for people to declare US policy in the Middle East a failure. I'm not sure what a success would look like, you know, given the current conditions. I don't know who could have fixed that, in, given the animosities that are, are prevalent there. But where do you see the US going forward? We, we still have an enormous military power, uh, and uh, under the current administration, no hesitation to deploy it. We've got aircraft carriers right off the coast of, of Lebanon. Um, but that's not going to solve the problem. That's, that's going to always just going to be a little Band-Aid. Um, where do you see US policy in the future in the Middle East? Wh where do our interests really lie? And uh, I guess, can you parse how two different administrations, a, a Harris or Trump administration, would, would go? Well, you know, <laughs> there have been many US presidents who declared that they aim is to pivot away from the Middle East. Remember George W. Bush, uh, you know, in 2001? So uh, the U.S. is uh, contending with the global area of threats. Uh, and a lot of people would argue that the rising China is the threat number one, and the security of Europe is the threat number two, and the Middle East is really not uh, the core priority for the U.S. At the same time, the U.S. gets, every time it tries to pivot away, gets drawn back into the Middle East just because, you know, it keeps exploding as it is now. So, um, you rightly said that the U.S. is not hesitating to deploy the military to the region, but it is very hesitant to get involved directly in any conflict in the region. Uh, also because, you know, all the memories of Iraq and Afghanistan and all the other, you know, quote unquote, endless wars. Uh, we are seeing this in Yemen now. You know, the uh, international trade is basically paralyzed in the Red Sea because the Houthis are using Iranian missiles to sink tankers and other ships. And the US, for most part, was just uh, shooting down Iranian missiles and only recently, you know, very reluctantly struck targets uh, in, uh, in Yemen, in Houthi controlled parts of Yemen. Um, so um, the stock of uh, uh, American munitions is uh, not adequate for the challenges of the day. We've seen that the U.S. is running out of stuff to give to Ukraine, and it's running out of stuff to give to Israel. And I think one of the biggest lessons of these two wars is the need to invest so much more in the um, industrial military base because of the protracted nature of wars in the modern day, and also because of the you know, equalizing power uh, that the technology brings uh, to level the field for some of the uh, actors that used to be seen as weak but now actually can achieve results. Uh, and so um, how, where does it go with the election? Um, obviously, former President Trump has said that he would you know, be much more supportive of Israel. Uh, will he, in fact, if he wins the election, it's hard to predict because he was also seeking deals uh, with uh, you know, various uh, autocratic regimes, remember North Korea? Um, worked out so well. It worked out great, yes. Uh, so, um, I mean, it's no secret that uh, the current Israeli government is very much rooting for Trump administration. Um, I think the uh, one of the biggest uh, qualms that uh, governments in the region that are American allies, like the Saudis and the UAE and the Israelis, had uh, with the uh, Democratic Party was they saw them as far too soft on Iran. And uh, we saw Vice President Harris saying yesterday, when asked what is America's biggest adversary in the world, she said Iran. So that is also a pivot of sorts. So, as you rightly observe, the U.S. is a global power and has other priorities. China clearly is, longer term, our major concern in foreign policy. And then it's Europe. And, of course, Europe in involves your home country, Ukraine. Um, I'm curious, 
your your book sort of stops um, to 2023, and stops at the invasion of Gaza. Yeah, I'm I'm wondering how you how you feel things are going there now. Um, it's got a bit tougher. Uh, we've gone through numerous iterations of fights domestically about whether we s vote more money to support Ukraine. Um, as the U.S. gives unlimited arms to the Israelis, there's still this debate about how much um, latitude the Ukrainians can be allowed with U.S.-supplied weapons in, in terms of attacking Russia. It, it's, a, it's a pretty confusing picture. How do you see U.S. policy evolving towards Ukraine? And I have to ask you the same question, a Harris administration and a Trump administration, because I know that's, you know, when I was in Ukraine, that's all people talked about was U.S. politics, not Ukrainian politics. Yeah. Well, obviously, you know, I we all have seen the lesson of how U.S. politics involve, uh, affect Ukraine because when the funding was frozen um, because of reluctance of congressional uh, Republicans to pass the supplemental in the first half of this year, you know, it had direct consequences on the battlefield in Ukraine. You know, Ukraine was starved of ammunition. Uh, Ukrainian troops could not hold the front line. The city of Avdiivka, a uh, pretty strategic little town in Donbass, uh, was taken by the Russians, which then allowed them to kind of roll into the surrounding countryside and advance a significant uh, bit towards you know, other big cities like Pokrovsk. So uh, we, already s we have already seen this example. Even though the supplemental was passed and the money started flowing again, the damage was done and, and the lives were lost there because the Afghan defenders uh, of Avdivka are dead now. So. Um, <coughs> I think uh, Ukrainians are very much concerned, but not just Ukrainians, I think Europeans in general are very much concerned about uh, a potential cutoff of further American aid uh, to Ukraine. I think there is a lot of, uh, I would say fear in the countries bordering Russia, like Poland, Finland, you know, the Baltic states, because there is a understanding that if Russia is allowed to win in Ukraine, to roll over Ukraine, absorb its resources, absorb its people, then the next step, I mean, they will be the next victims. And obviously, cutting off American aid to Ukraine uh, would mean walking away from commitments to NATO in general. Because I think the credibility of the U.S. You know, willing to contemplate, uh, the credibility of the U.S., that is not losing any lives in Ukraine. There's no Americans fighting in Ukraine except volunteers, and in fact, very few of them. Uh, and just you know, handing over Ukraine to Russia for the sake of a relatively small amount of money, in terms of you know, because we are talking about fractions of, a, of the Pentagon's budget. I mean, who will believe that that administration would risk nuclear war with Russia over Lithuania? No one. And and it obviously will encourage the Russians to explore uh, further opportunities that would be right. You've written this wonderful book, which is available here, and I would encourage everyone to read. There are a couple of things that really struck me in the book. One was an interview you did with the mayor of Kharkiv, um, Terekov, I think his name is. Um, and it was in the subway, because Kharkiv was under bombardment. Uh, it's quite close to the Russian border. and. He's speaking to you in Russian. He points out that a large number of the people who are sheltering with him are either from Russia or have family in Russia and also speak Russian as their first language. And you notice a nice little journalist detail that it was a, a mobile library they'd set up for people to read books and while they were waiting out these bombardments. Most of the books were Russian. And yet you make very clear and repeatedly in the book that one of the problems that Russia has had in its fight with Ukraine is it projects onto Ukraine a Russian identity and assumes that because the cultures are so close that Ukrainians think the same way as Russians do. It doesn't take very long to visit Ukraine as a foreigner and you realize <laughs> these two countries are completely different. I took a group to, to Russia in 2018, some folks came, um, and the whole cultural scene there is so different to Ukraine. Um, I wonder how you feel about that and specifically, one little upper Sioux, you noted how weird it was for you, having been born and brought up in Kiev, 
to walk the streets of Kiev wearing body armor that you were more used to putting on in Iraq and Afghanistan? Yeah, and I was. I guess I'll start from from the end. Uh, it was really a really surreal moment. I remember because you know, I was in Kiev in January 2022, you know, kind of getting ready for the invasion. Having just spent uh, several months in Afghanistan, you know, where I watched the U.S. Uh, withdrawal, uh, watched how the uh, Afghan president came to the ramparts of the city, Ashraf Ghani, saying, you know, we will fight to the last soldier, we will defend the city, and the next morning, you know, he was in a helicopter on his way to Abu Dhabi, and the Taliban were in my hotel, you know, in there, you know, <coughs> with the long hair and, and sandals. And so, um, I think when the evasion began, and I was warned, I mean, I started the book with the and a meeting I had with the former president of Ukraine, Poroshenko, the night before, who kind of leaned towards me and said, you know, you tomorrow at 4 a.m., you know, if you want to leave the country, you still have a couple of hours to go to the airport. And I think the fear I had in the back of my mind was that, you know, what will happen? And will President Zelensky do an Ashraf Ghani as he was asked to do by many of, of his Western partners and, and leave? You know, Boris Johnson, the British Prime Minister, told me he called him that day and said, you know, you should set up a government in exile in London the way the Polish government did in 1939. And he refused. But the interesting thing was that the uh, city was full of people and bustling the day before the, the war. It was really hard to find parking, like in LA. Anyway. Uh, and then uh, four or five days later, I remember standing in the street outside our Airbnb, and there was not a single car on the street. It was, so that's, it was empty. And there was a thought of artillery and getting closer and closer to the city. And I was wearing, as you said, this body armor that I had brought from Kabul. Uh, and it really felt wrong. And I was just standing there like, okay, this is the city where I was a teenager. You know, every little piece of geography has emotional meaning. You know, I, you know this is a hospital where I went to have my eyes checked out. This is, you know, my art school. And so... Uh, I did feel this almost like a righteous anger about this. And, but what do you do with this uh, anger? And I guess for me, because um, having spent my life covering other people's wars, you know, almost all of them, <laughs> in 20, 20 something years, um, I felt this because I do speak the languages of Ukraine and uh, I know the place. I felt like I could be of more service there than in other places because I could bring this extra element of clarity to the narrative. And so I think uh, that pushed me to do things that I wouldn't do in other places and take a lot more risks. And I think I spent my time there, you know, the first year and a half of the war, just going to the front lines and being as close. Sometimes actually, like uh, there's one of the chapters in the book, is we went on the other side of the Russian front line <coughs> uh, with the Ukrainian reconnaissance team uh, and do crazy things that I would not have done because for me, the emotional stakes would have been different. That's interesting, because when you read the book, you get so close, you can almost smell the cordite. Um, I'm going to go to the audience for some questions now. Um, who has a question for Yaroslav? Sir, you put your hand up first. Yes. And we're going to bring you a microphone so we can all hear. Oh, you have to hold on to it. My question is uh, about a two-state solution and the fact that um, Hamas has no infrastructure, has no sense of governance. Uh, how in God's name is there ever going to be a two-state solution without leadership other than Hamas? And are the people of, this is a double-barreled question, are the people uh, of uh, the Palestinian territories um, being coerced into voting for Hamas, or are they generally behind Hamas? So it's both of those questions I would love an answer. Right. Well, I mean, Hamas came to power in Gaza, not in the West Bank, in Gaza, as a result of elections, which I believe were in 2007. And there were no other elections after that. So they only have voted once. Uh, and they didn't have a choice uh, after that. So most people who live in Gaza now were not even born 
what Hamas came to power. So they didn't have a choice in electing a leader. Um, or at least we're not voting each other. Probably most weren't voting given, given the, you know, the, uh, <coughs> the demographic you know, pyramids in Gaza. Uh, so um, it's clear it's, it's very hard to have a two-state solution when you know, the leading Palestinian movement in Gaza and perhaps in the West Bank if elections were had today uh, support the elimination of, of the state of Israel. But, you know, Will this be the case forever? Probably not. I think it's it's not something that can happen now. But the reason why most people in Gaza probably support Hamas is precisely because there is no there is no light in the tunnel. I mean, there is no political hope uh, for the Palestinians. If there were one, maybe there wouldn't be support. If there was some other leadership, if there was some other prospect. Who's next? Norman. I have two questions. And Wait I for the microphone, please. <laughs> oh. I have two questions for you. One about the first part of your presentation, one about the second part. All right. Okay, on the first part, it seems entirely clear to me that the right-wing government in power in Israel has a solution in mind. And it's ethnic cleansing or genocide. They're either going to kill the Palestinians or have them leave. They want the land and they are going to get it. Point number one. Now, switching over to Ukraine. You know, we've heard a lot about, for two years now, we've heard a lot about the F-16s. Where are the F-16s? What's the status? We've seen the Biden dribble out aid. Mm -hmm. Only when the Ukrainians are losing does it seem like the Biden administration is willing to give them aid. If they're winning, oh, no, they might get to Russia and stop the glide bombs. We can't have that. You know. So what's the status, as you see it, in Ukraine right now with adequacy of arms? Great questions, both. So um, there are certainly uh, ministers in the government that make very genocidal statements. Uh, is it the policy? I mean, they're not in, in the security cabinet, but still they are in the government and they're tolerated. Uh, would Netanyahu, if he could, uh, drive out the Palestinians from Gaza? Probably. He certainly has, in meetings with uh, foreign leaders has raised the idea of temporarily relocating uh, a large part of the population of Gaza to uh, Egypt and other countries. That's something that Egypt does not want and I think his counterparts do not believe in the temporary part of it. Uh, so, but that hasn't happened, right? I mean, right now, most people who were in Gaza, minus the 40 something thousand who were killed in the past year are still in Gaza. Uh, and so the reality is that just like the Israeli far right wants to cleanse the land, so does Hamas. And like uh, coming back to what I was saying in the beginning, this is this is this is the f the two choices in the future. Either the two people will try to kill each other and remove, which is you know would be one of the biggest catastrophes of human history, or they will have to find a way down the road to find political arrangements for coexistence. And how they will look, it's very hard to see now. But, you know, we cannot just accept the idea that mutual attempts at genocide is the only way forward, right? Uh, now, uh, going to Ukraine. Uh, you're correct. The, the aid has been dribbled. And one of the arguments I'm making in this book is that a lot of the military assistance, a lot of the capabilities that were eventually given to Ukraine in 2023, 2024, had they been given, <coughs> when Ukraine was, uh, was asking for them uh, in the very beginning, in, in the middle of 2022, they would have made all the difference. Because in the summer of 2022, uh, Ukraine had a numerical advantage in manpower in the battlefield. Uh, Russia only had about 100,000 soldiers in Ukraine, didn't have the mobilization yet. Putin was fighting with the professional army and could not accept 
the loss of face that you know mobilization would have engendered because he was claiming everything is going to plan, Ukraine had a chance. And it broke through the Russian lines, but it ran out of steam because it didn't have all the stuff that uh, came later, the tanks, the, you know, the Bradleys, uh, <coughs> uh, strikers, et cetera, et cetera. Now, F-16s, uh, the U.S. is not providing F-16s. The F-16s are being provided by uh, the European countries, uh, which could not do it for a long time because they required U.S. approval for the transfer of technology. And I think the biggest bottleneck is not just the F-16, uh, but the pilots. I mean, the tragedy of Ukraine is Ukraine had lots of very good pilots and really bad planes in the beginning. And these pilots are almost dead. And so now it has shiny new planes and the young and trained pilots that need to train more and more. And there's not very many of these planes yet. I think the number of F-16s that have been deployed, have delivered to Ukraine so far, is probably 10 at this stage. And they are awaiting um, the Swedish uh, uh, AWACS capabilities. Uh, the Swedes promised uh, two AWACS planes that would actually allow the Ukrainian F-16s then to operate uh, and evade uh, being shot down uh, by the Russian fighter jets. Who's next? Yes, sorry, you have your hand up and then, okay, well then you're next, <laughs> it's fine. Yes, hi, uh, Charlie Follett uh, from Santa Monica. Thank you for being here this afternoon. I did want to ask you about Ukraine and uh, the fact that um, it, it's obviously a long time uh, coming where we, the American government, allow Ukraine to use the Atakum missiles to hit targets inside Russia where all of their bombardment is coming from. Uh, the excuse is that uh, if we do that, it will expand the war, but the war have already been expanded by Russia receiving weapons and drones from Iran and North Korea. So as uh, Russia moves in on the strategic cities of uh, Pokrovsk and Chazneth Yar, uh, do you think it's possible that we will finally allow Ukraine to hit it where it counts? Uh, is it maybe after the election? Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so uh, this, this was one of uh, President Biden's actual, I think, very personal um, red lines, even though most of the administration was pushing for the permission to use ATA camps um, on targets inside Russia. That hasn't happened. Uh, Will it be a solution? Will it change the war? No, nothing. No, no individual weapon system you know, changes the course of the war. Uh, but all this deliberation has already given Russia time to adjust to this. They have removed the aircraft from, from uh, a lot of the aircraft from the range of the ATACMs, dispersed them further. So, and I think this is one of the tragedies of how this giant American aid was being delivered is that there was no surprise in any of that. Every time there was a lot of discussion, a lot of talk, a lot of warning the Russians, we will do that, which always gave them time to prepare and adjust. Uh, now, um, I think the US policy since this war started was to keep the war in Ukraine in Ukraine. And uh, I think the Ukrainians are increasingly realizing that they cannot win the war in Ukraine in Ukraine. Because if it's the attritional warfare in Donbass, where Russia just has a numerical advantage and, and more, more stuff and more ammunition, they will slowly and surely lose. So the Ukraine has to be asymmetrical. I mean, they've shown that with the uh, uh, strike in the Kursk region you know, of Russia, where they you know, surprised the Russians and gained significant territory. But also increasingly with these long-range strikes in Russia that Ukraine is doing with its own weapons. Ukraine is making long-range drones, they can uh, strike military targets you know, more than a thousand miles away. And it's also developing its own ballistic missiles. And we've seen the results uh, uh, in the last several weeks of you know, major munitions warehouses, major uh, fuel uh, facilities being struck far, far away in Russia. Ukraine still hasn't done a lot of things. For example, it has not struck Russian energy infrastructure because of pressure from the US of concerns that if, if, if it were to attack uh, Russian oil export facilities, uh, that would drive up the global price of oil. Sir, you had your hand up there. 
Hi, thanks so much. My name is Chris. I'm a teacher at a local high school down here. I've got some amazing students in the house. And uh, I love them all so much. i got a brand new daughter. I love her, my wife. And I just want to make sure that we're all going to be okay. Do you have any hope for the future? Um, in your experience with everything that's going on, you know, these, just these wars going on in Israel and Ukraine, is it going to be okay? Is it going to be World War Three? Are we going to be all right? If you can look behind the curtain, do you see anything? I think it's going to be more okay here than in many other places. It's nice to have oceans on both sides of you. Uh, no, I mean, seriously, I think uh, if you're asking, will there be a nuclear war? Uh, well, uh, I mean, Putin very successfully used nuclear blackmail to throttle Western assistance to Ukraine over the past two and a half years. But... You know, it turns out that all these red lines were just imagined so far. And, uh, you know, you now have Ukraine occupying Russian territory. Ukraine, as I said, striking deep in Russia. And it's clear that uh, the nuclear option has never been really on the table. Um, and I think a lot of the countries that are you know, backing or enabling Russia now, China, India, you know, would be very, very reluctant to do so if nuclear weapons were to be used. Um, and the war in the Middle East is the Middle East. Yes, ma'am. Can we wait for the microphone so that we can all hear? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, a year ago, the attack on the music festival and the underground tunnels that were found were fresh in the world's short attention span. Mm -hmm. Why did Israel wait so long to do a strong response like the pagers and the cell phones? Well, I think these are two different fronts, right? So the response initially was to attack Hamas in Gaza. Um, nothing was happening on the Lebanese border until then. And uh, Hassan Nasrallah, the head of Hezbollah at the time, made a fateful political decision to open a second front. Uh, and he thought he could uh, sort of keep the temperature at a certain level, not too hot, not too cold, just enough to create the nuisance for, uh, for Israel and to be able to say, I'm standing up for the Palestinian cause without risking a lot of war. And in that he miscalculated. We have one question from a lady at the front while the students make up their mind what their killer question is going to be. <laughs> um, uh, so you said that um, ideally there would be a two the solution for peace is mm -hmm. to have two, two states. Mm -hmm. But you also said that at this point right now there's no interest or any will to, to do the two states. So it's up to a little bit like to the international community, the United States being a very big part of it, to, uh, to push them toward that. Because right now there's like so much anger going on on both sides that nobody wants to, to do anything. President Macron of, Fran of France said that you cannot push for peace and still arm the people who are fighting. What do you think about that? Is that if, we are, if the international community really wants peace, what should they do? Should they keep arming the, the, the people who are fighting? Yeah, so um, I mean, I'm, uh, is it two-state solution, one-state solution? I mean, uh, I think we have no idea what the future will be like. And, you know, in some other universe, you can imagine, you know, Palestinians and Israelis living in one state, maybe. I mean, we, we have, you know, more than a million uh, Palestinian Arab citizens of Israel who live as Israeli citizens. And, uh, you know, the, one of the biggest surprises of this whole war was that uh, there has been absolutely no uh, violence within Israel between Israel's Arab and Jewish citizens, something that actually was happening in 2021. Uh, so uh, I think the, sort of, you know, the, the, uh, 
this dark smoke has to settle first and then we can <laughs> see uh, what is the way forward in terms of the political solution. Uh, now, I mean, President Macron uh, is not arming Israel. Uh, I mean, he did announce the suspension of uh, some military sales related to Gaza, but not to the war in Lebanon, not, not to uh, uh, confrontation with Iran. I mean, the same with the British government. Um, you know, Israel uh, is not just fighting in Gaza, it's also fighting against uh, Iran and Hezbollah. And Israel was not occupying any territory in Lebanon when this started uh, a year ago. Let's hear it from the students, if we may, please. Do you have a student there who's primed with a question? Um, does Israel target any uh, Palestinian hospitals or schools in Gaza? Sorry, what's the question? Does Israel target any um, Palestinian schools or hospitals in Gaza? Well, I mean, for sure we have seen Palestinian schools and hospitals uh, being hit by Israeli bombardments in Gaza. Now, uh, if you ask the Israelis, they would tell you they're not targeting them, necessarily, but they have been hit. Let's get another student question. One more student question. It's up to the students to help us out of this one. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Giovanna from University Prep. Um, I wanted to ask if Palestine does get taken over, how or will and how will it affect us? Uh, so in, what, in, what, in what sense? Um, yeah, United States, like, will and how will it f affect us? Well, I mean, right now, you know, Israel has security control over the Gaza Strip that is, you know, de facto occupied again, and it has military control over the West Bank, so that already happened. Um, how does it affect the U.S.? Directly, not much. I mean, it does affect, I think, the society here because we are seeing, you know, a pretty important generational split uh, uh, over support for Israel. And, you know, we obviously seen, you know, this past year, you know, events on campuses and U.S. universities. So it has become a, a domestic political issue in the U.S. in a way it has never been in the past, pr probably. So in that way, it is affecting the U.S. Okay, we have time for two more, I think. Susie, go ahead. <coughs> we'll get the microphone to you. Um, you haven't mentioned the United Nations in any of this, and there have no. been some judgments, some conclusions, some recommendations, whatever, that the United Nations has floated. F your sense is it is basically powerless well, in all of this. Um, so that's number one. Number mm -hmm. two is, as a journalist, do you know Gideon Levy and what do you think of his position? Uh, I'll start with number two, no, I don't actually know him. Uh, number one, um, you know, there used to be the League of Nations mm -hmm. before World War II and people were kind of mocking it as toothless and pointless, but at least the League of Nations could expel members for aggression, expelled Italy for invading Ethiopia. Now we have a situation where Russia, which is the biggest violator probably of the UN statutes, is actually a you know, permanent security council member of the United Nations, and you know, is also a very important player in the UN bureaucracy because you know, obviously it has quarters on staffing. Um, so the UN is really not a factor right now. I mean, it's paralyzed. You know, it's a, it's a, it, it is, does not have independent agency and any ability to really, as far as Security Council is concerned, to affect reality. And the General Assembly votes are uh, just recommendations that don't have any binding nature to them. Final question, Julian. Can you wait for the microphone so we can pick it up? Thank you. Please. Thank you. Uh, what do you think the chances of regime change, either in Iran or Russia, anywhere in the near term are? 
Who drops first, Yaroslav? Uh, I don't know. Well, I mean, uh, Ayatollah Khamenei is older uh, than President Putin. Um, you know, it's very hard to know what people think in Russia and Iran just because you know, polling is very unreliable in autocratic regimes. You know, if you, they have polling in Russia, but if you give the wrong answer, it's actually a criminal offense. Uh, and you can end up in prison, as people do. But just based on uh, sort of very uh, fragmentary observations, the, there is a lot more people in Iran who oppose the government, the Islamic Republic, and how willing to do something about it. And it was really interesting to watch the reactions to the uh, decapitation of Hezbollah, to see how many Iranians were actually celebrating it very often. Um, and, uh, you know, th there are people in the Middle East who compare Iran today to the late Soviet Union so with the, you know, the great dissatisfaction of its people with the system. Uh, however, you know, the regime and the besiege and, you know, the people who hold power are the people with the weapons there. And they are invested in the survival of the system. And so I think it's foolish to make prophecies about the downfall of the Iranian regime. And in any case, it can only fall from within. Like the, the Iranians will never support a foreign power trying to overthrow it. Um, when it comes to Russia, I think there is continuing and growing support for this war in Russia. We have not seen any visible signs of opposition to it, and people who don't like it mostly left the country. And so um, regime change in Russia can only come as a result of a defeat of the Russian military that is undeniable. And again, it can only come from within. I mean, nobody can impose it. So let me thank um, the Lavak staff for making this run so smoothly. <laughs> thank you to the audience for your great questions. And a huge thank you to Yaroslav for sharing his experience. Thank you. And uh, the book is over there. Well, uh, this has been an absolutely fascinating discussion. Thank you, Yaroslav. Thank you. And Terry, thank you for uh, moderating a wonderful discussion. Uh, before we thank Yaroslav in a more tangible way, let me do just a couple of things. Uh, one is I'd like to recognize our, our board members from the World Affairs Council. If I could ask, we have several here. Could I get you to stand up and uh, be recognized? And please, and, and that includes you, Kevin. That's great. Thank you. And uh, whether, one other min administrative uh, uh, item. This event was billed as a lunch, but just so you're aware, unfortunately, when there's more than 30 people, we had, we had, we, we, if it was limited to 30, we have tables in here, and the administration said you could have lunch. But with no tables, they said no lunch. So as a result, there are box lunches that we will give you on your way out. So I, I, I apologies for that. Um, we will uh, we'll see how we work that. But just so you're aware, that's the that was it was a management from uh, requirement. So we, we and we didn't want to lose the chance to continue to use this room. So, any event. Um, uh, by the way, the discussion was was wonderful, and your questions were very very helpful in, in making this such a fascinating discussion. So thank you all for being here. I, I, and uh, again, Terry and Yaroslav, thank you very much. I'd like to ask Thomas Malio, one of our board members, to, to say thanks to uh, Yaroslav in a more tangible way to thank you and, uh, for, for being uh, for, for this. And would you please join me in thanking Yaroslav Shafimov for being here today. <laughs> Wonderful discussion. Thank you so much, Larry. And, and again, uh, please take those, uh, take those folders if you would. And uh, remember on the 16th, this is Rick Caruso. It should be a great event. On the 29th of this month, we're on Mexico with the, uh, the Council General. Thank you again. Well,